Welcome everybody to Business Monday. I'm Josh Fenton, CEO of Go Local. With me here in the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center is the one and only Chiching Gary Sass, the Money Man. Uh, rich guys like you love this kind of Monday. Uh, trade war is cool. Stock market goes flying through the roof. You probably picked up ten, fifteen million dollars on that uh, one-day performance. Because because Trump says he has a ninety-day cooling off period with the Chinese. <laughs> I don't think the trade war is over. <laughs> um, let, let's go all education today. Last week, I think uh, Rhode Islanders got a heavy dose of reality. Uh, test scores came out. We've changed test scores. Uh, test. Uh, 11 times in the last three weeks because we don't like the results. Now we're on the same testing structure as the state of, as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we get a reality check. Uh, we're going to go through some of the districts in a second, but we find out that on uh, on one major test we're 17 percent on average behind Massachusetts, and on the other we're 20 percent behind Massachusetts. Um, it, it, this is no, this is a no joke situation. Our kids are underperforming the kids right across the state. Uh, what happens? And uh, let's start with how did we get here? Let's start with how did we get here? Well, we got here for three or four reasons, and the best way to figure out how we got here is to look what Massachusetts did right and what we did wrong. And yep. that, that'll answer the Please. question. Well, the first is a constitutional reason. Uh, when people in Massachusetts challenge the uh, adequacy and the equity of the formula. Uh, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court said they had a case, and that put enough pressure on the political class that they had to fix it. And this is about 25, 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, about 1991, 92. Yeah. Right? Uh, <coughs> we challenged it several times. I've written several amicus briefs. First challenged it with our good friend Buddy Sancy in yeah. 1981 when Judge Needham said we were right, and then it was a political decision by the Supreme Court. But at that time, uh, justices of the Supreme Court were chosen by the House of Representatives. And while I can't prove this to my dying day, I will believe that reversal of Needham's decision uh, was a political decision because the opinion reversing the decision was not that detailed, was not, right. that, was not that well written. And so <clears throat> we do not have education as a fundamental enforceable right. States that have education as a fundamental enforceable right give parents and give educators leverage to force change when the system is not performing, and particularly not performing well for disadvantaged kids. So we have a constitutional problem. The second problem, as you alluded to, is a problem of political will. Massachusetts, when Massachusetts reformed its system, it was comprehensive and it was consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, and through both Democrat and Republican uh, governors, it, it stayed the same. Uh, there was strong House leadership by then Speaker Bulger, you know, Governor Weld of yep. two parties. And while it hasn't been as perfect as the people in Massachusetts would lead you to believe, <laughs> it, it has been basically comprehensive and, and consistent compared to Rhode Island's. Rhode Island has been piecemeal. Uh, you know, we changed our, the uh, high stakes testing regimen in, in 2014 and 2007. We pushed it back to 2020. Uh, if anybody complained that their kid uh, was in, had it performed to high standards and the legislature you know, would, would, would change right. it, uh, we had a real change agent here, Deborah Gist, a uh, chair administration appointee. Uh, Bob Flanders was chairman of the Board of Regents when she was appointed. And she came here for one reason, to do what they did in Massachusetts, right. to be tough, to have high performance, high stakes testing, you know, a high evaluation of teachers, the whole nine yards of accountability. Uh, she was run out of town. This, this governor refused to reappoint her. So you have a whole series of things where we lack the political will. And I define, let me well, just finish uh, one point. Yeah. And I define political will as being comprehensive and consistent and not piecemeal. Okay, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Absolutely. Why isn't there the political will? Why isn't. Uh, I mean, it, virtually every single person, it was as if uh, the Patriots won the Super Bowl on Facebook or President Bush died. Every single posting on, I think it was Thursday night, uh, Wednesday or Thursday, was on this issue of the test results. People were offended, disappointed. I think some were shocked, others weren't. The word is uh, embarrassed. We should have been embarrassed. As embarrassed. Yeah. yeah, embarrassed as a state. And l let me give you some numbers. Um, Meeting or exceeding uh, in Fall River for eighth graders is about 40% of the population, okay? 
Yeah. In Barrington on the uh, eighth grade, I think this is the uh, math test, on Barrington, uh, uh, only 60% are meeting or exceeding. In, in Johnston, meeting or exceeding, 23%, half of Fall River's performance. But you, you could summarize it this way, and um, it's really simple. Rhode Island, if you looked at Rhode Island's statewide performance, we're on par with Fall River. Fall right. River is considered a disadvantaged, poor community. The textile mills, textile companies abandoned 30 years ago. <coughs> you know, it, it hasn't come back yet. Uh, it has a very challenged population from a democratic perspective, and on and if you and, and we are, we are we are so, so let's not leave that point. Our education performance is, as a state is that equal to Fall River, Massachusetts. That's what that, that's what the okay. And, and in Massachusetts, thing. Fall River's education performance is at the bottom of the proverbial bucket. Yeah, if and even in the case of Barrington, Barrington and East Greenwich schools is only marginally better than Fall River. But a better comparison with, with, with Barrington, because this is not just an issue of, of poor communities versus sure. rich communities. The right comparison is to compare Barrington to communities in Massachusetts that have the same socioeconomic... Sure, system. Western Mass. Yeah, I think right. that Longmead was what the community compared. And so our wealthier communities don't compare with moderately wealthy communities in Massachusetts. Not even close. No, our poorer communities don't compare with poorer communities in, in Massachusetts. If Rhode Island was a single school district, we just had one school district, took all 150,000 kids and said that was one uh, school district, uh, we would be in the bottom 10% with Massachusetts. It is unexplainable. And the rationalization, which is pure BS, that this is a different test. If you look back at the park test and look at other assessments, the nominal grades were higher, but, but there really wasn't that much difference. No, when, when the park test came out, they came out in Massachusetts as well. They came out in Rhode Island. Worcester, Mass. was doing better than uh, Lincoln and Cumberland, yeah. some of our ta higher performing, wealthier suburban communities. And, and, you know, the difference, though, just to go to Fall River versus Providence, uh, Fall River doesn't have an east side of Providence, Okay. And while many of That's those kids, <laughs> they may, many of those kids may be in prep school. They're not all in prep school. No, and some are in public school in, in Providence. And Providence's uh, was 15%. Fall River's 40%. Well, I'm, I'm trying to you know, disaggregate the reasons why. And we, we stopped at that point. So we disaggregated two reasons. Lack of political will, constitutional problems, not having education as an enforceable right. And I might add that uh, you know, when I, when we work with the school committee associated and others and have come to the legislature every year for a decade now and asked them to put a constitutional question on the ballot changing the uh, Rhode Island Constitution to make education an enforceable right. We can't even get a hearing on that. But the third reason is interesting too is how we govern our schools and, and, and form follows function here. So structure is important. Uh, in Rhode Island, uh, the state commissioner, whoever they call the state commissioner, has an active role in helping uh, you know, schools uh, meet state obligations. Uh, in Rhode Island, we have a regulation and oversight model. That's mm -hmm. a big difference. In Massachusetts, at the local level, uh, they have more of a site-based management participatory model. Our model is here, school committees are responsible for the there's a language and statute of care, control, and management. So that means they get involved not in policy, but in, in, the, in the weeds and the day-to-day -day, you know, stuff. So we have a governance structure that's not focused totally on policy, on performance. Uh, we have an education uh, ride. People criticize ride, and I'm not going to do that, just to the extent to say that their culture of regulation and oversight is different from cultures in other states, which is more you know, helpful uh, in working with communities. So we have a, a governance model that's, that's inconsistent with Massachusetts. Back when Bruce Sunland was on the school committee in uh, Providence, in Providence uh, he had me run a bunch of numbers for him. If, and the question was this. It's kind of funny now. He said, if we gave each school district, I forgot the number, 250000 and said, here's your 250000 run yourself. We had site-based management. Uh, you know, what would happen? Well, site-based management is important because it involves parents, teachers, you know, students, uh, the, the, the whole building community. And you know, we don't have that approach here. We talk about that approach here. 
uh, but nothing ever seems to get implemented. So you can go back and look at the structure. I'm not saying you change the structure and you don't have it. Okay, but we've talked about the failure of ride. We've talked about some I structural issues. I talked about the culture of ride, not the failure. Uh, okay, the, the, the culture. Why aren't parents, parents up in arms about the quality of their children's education? Why aren't they, they're paying the same roughly ballpark, same level of taxes in Rhode Island as Massachusetts. We're paying, we're paying much higher property taxes here because of Proposition 2.5. And, and, and the per pupil spending in Rhode Island is right up there with the highest states in the country. It's not that we haven't invested in the, in the education system. Well, we don't, it's, it's not, we're not Mississippi. Well, we, we, we spend less, than, not significantly less than Massachusetts, but if you look at uh, uh, you know, revenues you know, per student and average you know, daily attendance, uh, we rank 10th, 10th highest in the country. That's that would be pretty good. Uh, yeah, if Massachusetts ranks 8th. And so there's about a 5 or 6 percent you know, difference uh, in terms of teacher salaries, you know, the same, or instructional salaries, you know, they're third, we're, f we're fifth. So, yeah, it's not a question of money. And then one of the biggest lies it's told is that somehow the state's not doing enough here. But if you look at uh, the Massachusetts, but it was the percentage of support that comes from the state of Massachusetts and Rhode Island are almost identical. Uh, one's about 38.8%, one's about 39.8%. So is it Quabbin Reservoir versus uh, Providence Water Supply Board? I mean, why? No, oh. it's, it's, it's what I mentioned. Is it a culture of mediocrity here? Let me well, ask you well, that. Is it, it that way? I wish it was mediocrity. You look at these scores and it's something <laughs> else. But, but no, it's, 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 it's not having, uh, that's why I want to get back to the mechanics of the process. It's not making educational and enforceable. Are we right. the Cleveland Browns? Should we okay, ask Condoleezza, uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice to be our superintendent well, of well, uh, well, uh, commissioner of education? Well, I'll, I will say this, that, that these things don't get fixed unless there's unbelievably focused leadership coming from the front office of the state house. Education reform agendas are taken serious when the governors of various states say, job, my job one is educating the kids, my job one is making certain that <coughs> there's good performance, high performance in my schools, my job number one is making sure there are high ex educational expectations. We give lip service to this, but I go back and look at Governor Weld, I look back at, at Governor Hunt in North Carolina about 20 years ago, <coughs> and, and most of the states that have turned around their education system, it's because the governor's force of will that they, they wouldn't rationalize underachieving, they wouldn't take no for an answer, they didn't worry about corporate welfare, they worried about the welfare of kids. And I think we need, that's, that's the political sea change we want to make. What this cries out for is leadership. There's nothing that you and I have spoken about that is a mystery. But, uh, but isn't leadership sometimes, oftentimes, uh, a reaction to jumping to the front of the parade, right? Uh, I, I, I was on the city council, you worked with him, but he's Yancey, I'm not sure what he believed in or what he didn't believe in, but if he found a mob going down the street with pitchforks, you bet he was going to run to the front of that mob and lead them to the promised land. There, there's no significant outrage uh, being voiced in any organized structure uh, to be able to make this any more than maybe a couple week blip. That's a very good observation because I don't recall, and I've been traveling some, so I, I may have missed it. Uh, <coughs> did the governor have a press conference? Governor did not have a press conference. Governor issued a statement from, through her spokesperson who said that uh, her education strategy was improving because third grade tests were better than eighth grade tests. Well, I got to tell you, third grade tests outperform eighth grade tests in every test for the last 400 years because it's easier to teach elementary school children to perform. Uh, the subjects are not as complicated as it is to, co to teach eighth graders. Well, you could look at that, that, that two ways, and you're right, but, but you could look at it two ways. If our third grade is performing better than our eighth grade, our kids get done with the longer they stay in our public schools. 100%. I mean, uh, uh, they underperform. First, there's just a natural progression of uh, that uh, the uh, outside factors begin to influence them. Eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade is tough. Seventh and eighth grade is tough. And there's always, I don't care what the test is, the performances always go down the, the versus the third grader, certainly in park and the other tests that have been implemented. So that, uh, her comments were uh, beyond 
uh, intellectually dishonest uh, from a fact standpoint. Uh, but there was no outrage. It was, yes, we're doing better and we're, we've got a strategy. Uh, why would you ever invest in Rhode Island Promise to send more kids ill-prepared to go to college uh, and not focus those resources and those energies on K through 12. Well, we don't have, there's already a question of whether we, or not we have a strategy. There was an op-ed that was penned by Neil Steinberg about two, three months ago in the Providence Journal. Yep, he was on talking about it as well. And, and one of the things that the Rhode Island Foundation, uh, you know, which you know is an honest broker in this entire conversation, said that we didn't have was an educational strategy. Right. Well, I believe the Rhode Island Foundation that we don't have an educational strategy. I believe the Rhode Island Foundation, when we, when I'm repeating myself, uh, don't make education an enforceable right so parents can get leverage. I believe that it's not an educational strategy when we issue a call for an education bill of rights which says kids will be, have adequate resources, be taught with good teachers, go to schools that are, <coughs> that are appropriately funded for, for stu student need, and it's too difficult f to issue an executive order saying that the kids in Rhode Island have a fundamental educational right. We have a Bill of Rights, you know, for education, and these are the goals we want to achieve. I mean, what does it, that tell you? Is there a federal court case that can be implemented? Isn't I, there? I don't think so. There's a, you know, the Rodriguez case back 40 or 50 years ago that challenged the question, uh, said <coughs> basically uh, education was a state responsibility. Now, there's a case brought. We were involved with the case, and I stepped back from it because we didn't want uh, the Hassan Federal Institute being viewed as, you know, ch uh, <laughs> challenging, uh, suing the governor of <laughs> the legislature. I think it was university would like that. But no, seriously. <laughs> and th but their suit's narrow. They're basically saying, and it's, a, it's in the federal district court here right now, they're saying kids, because of our educational system, kids are not able to exercise their civic responsibility. Right, that, that case <laughs> filed last week. Right. Now, that's fine. Let's see where that goes. But the more immediate concern, if people are concerned about the savage inequalities that exist in our public schools, then the place for the initial remedy, which can be remedied in two years, is to get the legislature, get the governor to use her clout, get the legislature to put on the ballot a question to a modify the Constitution, which basically says kids in Rhode Island have an enforceable right to go to schools that provide <coughs> adequate educational opportunities. And, and, and until you do that basic thing, the parents don't have leverage. Massachusetts was kicked on the path that they took because they had met the, the Supreme Court in Massachusetts, whatever they call their Supreme Court, right. you know, basically but, said, but, yeah. But, but usually the discussion here in Rhode Island is uh, focused on poor kids aren't getting their fair share of education. They don't get their fair share of funding. They're at a disadvantage. Well. These test results show that the Narragansett school system of meeting and exceeding uh, the standards are that, in Narragansett, are that of, Nar of Fall River. But let me put it Narragansett, <coughs> one of the most affluent places. There's more, there's more mansions on the, on the waterfront uh, than, than Fall River's ever read about. Well, but let me put it in, in, in perspective because, you know, you're right, but you could also disaggregate the figures. So if you look at the figures in, in aggregate, sure. uh, both in uh, English and uh, you know, learning uh, and, and in math, you're right. You know, we're 33 percent proficient in English uh, skills. It's 27 in math. That's about what math. The Fall River is actually a little bit above that. They're yep. about 34 and 30. But then when you disaggregate it by poor kids and by other kids, our kids that are not poor, for lack of a better description, do better. They, they're not quite as high as the Massachusetts average, but <coughs> for uh, learning, for English learning skills, uh, we're 49th, so Massachusetts is 54th or something percent is proficient. Uh, math, we're 40, they're slightly higher. So the, the, the kids, uh, we perform on average for non-poor kids. Now for poor kids, this is where the savage inequalities come in. Uh, in uh, English uh, language skills, uh, our poor kids uh, are 18 percent proficient. Yep. On math, they're 14 percent efficient. Right. If you look at the urban districts, uh, some aren't even quite that high. Right. Which really makes you ask the question, and this is this is, you know, where it becomes more than just a, the, the the social problems that exist. Educational performance. I won't say this twice. Educational performance is a predictor of economic performance. Right. A and 
and states compete to offer the most productive environment for business. And the key issue in improve, improving the productivity of, of a state uh, is education, because right, talent of the workforce. Yeah, that 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 that's exactly right, and that wasn't said just by you and me. That was you know, said by every economic development specialist. And then you add in the fact that we do have great colleges and universities, but we are the second highest uh, urban area for losing our college graduates outside of the market. 70% of those graduating from Brown, RISD, URI, Providence College, Johnson & Wales are on a bus, train, or plane out of here uh, as soon as they graduate. Yeah, let's, let's focus on one thing, and the governor has said this, but sometimes we lose focus in implementation. We have a lot of different issues. Uh, <coughs> retaining college graduates is, is one. You know, we have some programs, the Wavemaker program, to try to you know, yep. counter it. But the most serious problem, at least in my judgment, is what's happening in grades K through 8. Yep. Because we know that if a kid can't read by the end of the third grade, he or she is going to have academic issues you know, going, going, going forward. And so instead of every kind of boutique program, you know, everything that captures a headline, uh, <coughs> let's, why aren't we focusing on what the problem is? And, and the problem is, very simply stated, we have to have uh, high achievement uh, performance levels. It, uh, we have to have rigor rigorous evaluation of students and, and, and teachers. Uh, and we have to have uh, tests you know, where there are consequences if you, if you don't do well. Now, we know that works. We, which it's worked everywhere. We lost a commission of education that wanted to do that because, first of all, her style was not always the most conducive style to be. She it, was, it was unique sometimes. She wasn't loved. <laughs> and I was involved in her hiring. But, but, but you know, that, that aside was on that track. And, got, and, the, and it was, you know, every time an interest group complained to the legislature, it was one step forward, two steps back. Well, let me ask you a question. So uh, Thursday, I believe it was Thursday, it might have been Friday, but Thursday or Friday, uh, excuse me, Wednesday or Thursday, I think it was Thursday, when the test came out, uh, there was uproar. But by the weekend, it had turned into teachers' unions versus, uh, and, 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 and this, the X factor, listen, we know the political dynamics of the municipalities versus uh, the teachers' union. This is going to require a very significant, different dynamic of parents who are middle class, who are voters, to be able to come forward and say, my kid's not getting a fair share. And, and I think the most... And by the way, their kid's not getting a fair share. And, and the, the, the worst thing we can do, and I wrote something for Ed Dupree on this a long time ago about education policy, it's a question of uh, joining hands and not pointing fingers. Absolutely. And, and, and so when, when, when people you know, criticize the unions, and I disagree with the unions on a lot of things, but it's not their fault. Yeah. Uh, when, when people criticize Riot, we know Riot can do better. We think Riot's coach can be improved. It's not their fault. It's a f breakdown of the political leadership in the state that the, the, the policy and the attitude is not focused on what we know the problem is, and it's not making people see the advantages of joining hands and not pointing fingers. So it's very easy to sit up in the state house and be like Pontius Pilate. You know, wipe your hands and say, no, it's the union's fault. No, it's business's fault because they won't pay taxes. No, it's the poor parents because they're not interested. Yeah, we have problems in all, all of those areas, but, but that's not what leadership's about. Leadership is having the press conference, explaining to the people why this happened. You know, some of the explaining why we're different from Massachusetts. We did this here in the last 10 minutes, and then saying this is what we're going to do to change it. And and, and, and as if teachers don't like uh, you know teacher evaluation, right? Uh, if parents don't like high stakes testing, can't help it. That's what leadership does, and not worry about what happens the next election. Uh, education is not a popularity contest, and that's, that's part of the problem. Is it an opportunity for the governor, who is not facing re-election, she's in her second term of, in, in his term limited, to be able to do maybe some bolder things relative, because she doesn't per se have to worry about this constituency or that constituency uh, getting upset with her. Um, and it's that opportunity to you know, uh, to do the right thing and to demonstrate, listen, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We know what works right across the, the state. Uh, and I'll also say, that's, uh, that's opportunity one, is an opportunity two that parents really need to come forward 
and start to talk about these things in a different way. Oh, we have to get parents more involved, uh, absolutely. And, and so the question is, how do you do this? Well, we know school-based management is not a panacea, but it's a device. You, you have to come up with devices that create certain kind of behavior. So if you have school site management, <clears throat> that helps. If, if you have a school site management and the principal's picking up the phone and saying, you know, uh, you know, Johnny hadn't been doing his homework, you know, recently. There, there are things that we have to do right. institutionally to get parents, parents more involved. Uh, and it's not, it's, as you point out, it's not just parents in the poor communities, it's parents throughout the entire state. Uh, but we're no different. If you look at the, see, the, the difference between Massachusetts and Rhode Island can't be justified on financial or demographic differences. We're the same people and we finance our government roughly the same way with us having higher property taxes because with that being the exception. So you've got to go, it's the Quabbin Reservoir versus uh, Situate, that well, there's something in the water that does it. La last thing, you're uh, uh, given uh, all-powerful uh, uh, authority. Uh, what's the one thing you would do in our last uh, minute uh, that would kick off the initiative right here and right now to say over the next two decades we're going to create the best educational system listen uh, uh, Saul Kaplan's on next he says it's way easier to do it in a state of a million people there's no it's it's much easier to change behavior than one six times larger what are we going to do what's the first step well, well, well the first step is for somebody to take responsibility and then assume leadership my experience suggests that when the responsibility is taken, uh, it's most effectively taken by a governor. Uh, and so that's the first step. And then to be very clear of that we're not going to tolerate failure in terms of performance. And we're going to have high stakes uh, for what happens in schools. Uh, we're going to look at what happened in other places on uh, you know, governance structure, uh, who's responsible for what, what roles and responsibilities. Uh, we're going to give parents leverage so they can challenge in court if they think their kid's getting screwed. Uh, those are the things, and not worry about, it's, I know it's around Christmas time, but not worry about the bells and whistles. Yeah. It's, it's really fundamental, this is fundamental blocking and, 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 and tackling. We're not talking about anything you know, different from that. And, and have consequences. So, you, you, what two things that are missing, uh, and they're easy to say, how to implement. You know, one's accountability, because as we had this in conversation for the last half hour, we haven't said, who's accountable? Right. And then the second, that, that it's for accountability to mean anything, there has to be consequences. So what's the consequences for failure? What's the consequence for parents? What's the consequence for school buildings, elected officials, unions? There has to be... Well, we know what the consequences are. We have a bottom 10 state economy for decade after decade. Let me go to the last thing. I do want to make this point. I think the commissioner of education deserves some credit. And, and I'll tell you why. He didn't make a lot of excuses. He said, here, it was a Bill Parcells comment, right? You are what you are. He didn't say, well, the sun was in my eyes or this, that, or the other thing. He said, this is the reality. We're behind. But the second, and I agree with you, and I, I think he did, that was appropriate on his part. <coughs> the, the second question he asked to answer, when, when Bill Parcells said he was behind, and said because the quarterback couldn't throw the ball 10 yards to, to a target, he went out and got him a quarterback that could throw 10 yards. Well, but thousand. also it was the NFL and he can cut anybody any time, so it makes it a no, little no, easier. That, no, it doesn't make it any easier. That, that, and that is the key point, and that's the point of, of leadership, of holding people accountable, and you hold them accountable by having consequences for their actions, and that has to... <laughs> it has to come from the grassroots up. You're not going to reform education from the top down. We, we do that too often. It has to come from the grassroots up, but you have to have a cheerleader at the top yeah. making sure that the grassroots is growing. Uh, Gary Sass, the money man. We talked a lot about education today. Uh, you're an expert on it. I want to thank you very much for your insights. We're going to be right back here at the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. Just about 30 seconds with Saul Kaplan from Business Innovation Factory. Uh, talking about what the implications of a second tier uh, educational system is on the economy and innovation in transforming Rhode Island. We'll be right back.